Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about pap smear reporting and normal colposcopy. colposcopy. So, uh, to many of us, these look like pink and purple blobs on a screen, but to the trained cytologists, they actually mean something. So one of the things that you can see when, when, when somebody looks at a pap smear is that you see the different types of squamous cells. So when you do a pap smear, you want to make sure that you can see even the endocervical cells, the parabasal cells, so that you can see all the layers. And then once you can see all the layers, then you can call it an adequate pap smear and you can say if it's a SIN 1, 2, or 3. So we'll come to that. So there are different types of squamous cells that, that, a, colpos, uh, that a, a cytologist looks at under the, on a pap smear. There's the superficial cells in A, the intermediate cells, the basal cells, and then there's the metaplastic cells. Metaplastic does not mean cancer. So when the pap smear comes back with metaplasia. It just means that one cell type is changing into another cell type, which is what happens at the transformation zone. So metaplasia is not cancer, it is normal. Okay, so since when? 1950s, 1960s, we've had something called the Bethesda classification which they update every so now and again, and the last update was in 2014. And this tells the cytologist exactly how to report a pap smear. So what, you, what they will say first is what type of, of um, pap or what type of smear it is. Is it liquid-based or is it a normal um, pap smear that's done with a um, word gone, spatula? Um, and then they will comment on the specimen adequacy. So that's if they can see all the different types of squamous cells, um, and if they can see some endocervical cells, that means you have taken a pap smear that includes the transformation zone. Um, so they will say it's satisfactory for, satisfactory for evaluation, um, and there is presence of transformation zone, or there are endocervical cells there present. If it's unsatisfactory, it means they cannot see endocervical cells or they cannot see the transformation zone or that there's a lot of blood and inflammation and they can't really tell whether you've got a, a, a good specimen or not. Okay. And then after that, they will give it a general classification and that is either um, negative for epithelial, uh, intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, NILM, which we see there, <laughs> or other, which we'll get to, or an epithelial abnormality, which will be SIN 1, 2, or 3, or high cell or low cell. Okay. So that is, let's we'll carry on. So if it is negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, then they can still make other comments there. So don't get thrown by that. Because even though it's negative for malignancy, there might be something else there like inflammation, there might be an infection, there might be reactive changes, they might be seeing radiation effects, um, they might be seeing pregnancy. Um, and often you can, they can pick up an infection on a pap smear. Um, and that takes a very, very good eye. The other, is if you see endometrial cells, endometrial cells, not endocervical cells, endometrial cells on a woman over the age of 45, it's usually abnormal. And it usually means that the lesion that they're seeing on the pap smear is coming from higher up in the uterus. Okay, so this is why I say you have to be trained. That's a trichomonas infection. I mean, to us, it kind of just looks like more purple dots, but you can see some inflammatory cells there, um, and there is their little trike with the arrow. Okay. <laughs> okay, so then if we look at the, the epithelial cell abnormalities, um, 
This is where Bethesda changed in 2014. So they no longer say SIN 1, SIN 2, SIN 3. So the problem with SIN 2 is that there is observer variability. So what they have said is either you need to classify it as a low-grade lesion or a high-grade lesion. And that helps quite a lot because that is the whole essence of who you're going to try and send to colposcopy. So what we want to see at colposcopy is the high-grade lesions because those are the ones that are most likely to turn into cancer. The other thing that I forgot to say about a pap smear is that you are seeing individual cells on a slide. You are not seeing a basement membrane. You are not seeing histology. So if you get a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma on a pap smear, it's not telling you if it's invasive squamous cell carcinoma or if it's just sitting on the cells on the surface. It's telling you the cells are abnormal. You need to go and have a better look or take a histological biopsy. So there is no point in working up somebody who comes with a squamous cell carcinoma pap smear and doing a whole oncology workup because we don't know how big that lesion is. Is it microinvasive? Is it not? Is it adenoma? Is it carcinoma in situ? In other words, it hasn't invaded the basement membrane. So a pap smear is not histo histology, and to work a patient up for cancer, you need histology. Okay, so. If we go through the squamous cell abnormalities, um, you can get ASCUS, which is atypical squamous cells of uncertain significance. And those generally are similar to low cell. And then you get atypical squamous cells. High cell cannot be excluded. And those generally are, typical, are, are the same as, as, as a high cell. And then, as I said, you, it's now low cell and high cell. And you'll see there, I put there CIS as well, which is carcinoma in situ. It means that the cells look very ugly on the slide, but they, you can't say whether it's invaded through the basement membrane. Okay. And then if they really look like the, the, that they are cancer, then they will say squamous cell carcinoma. So carcinoma in situ is treated similarly to a high cell. It's not a carcinoma. It hasn't invaded the basement membrane. Okay. So the glandulars, um, are, are, they haven't really got a good um, way of saying which glandular ones are going to go into cancer and which ones aren't. Um, so they've got atypical glandular cells not otherwise specified, and then atypical glandular cells favoring neoplasm. And then they want to know, is it coming from the endocervix or is it coming from the endometrium? And then we have adenocarcinoma in situ and then adenocarcinoma. And sometimes they can do special stains for us, which will help us tell whether it's coming from the endocervix or from the endometrium. Okay. All right. So when, when they look at a high cell, they might see something like that arrow there where you see an irregular dark nucleus. Um, so this is a slide I quite like because this is exactly saying what Professor Boerta was saying, is who do we want to see at colposcopy? So the, um, the ones in the red are the ones that are at high risk for cancer. So if you're going to do cytology and you get a normal smear, that's blue, it's very low risk. If you get a high cell, that's telling you it's very high risk, we need to see them at, at colposcopy. And low cell and ascus, meh, it's a bit orange. You know, if we see them all at colposcopy, we might end up over-treating them. We actually really need something that's going to distinguish. So what we do in, our in, in, in South Africa is that we have to do two low cell smears, which will tell us that the HPV is um, persistent in the cervix before we will see them at colposcopy. The alternative is to then add HPV testing to that. And now if you have an HPV positive ascus, that's telling you that it is a little bit more than just an ordinary, ordinary ascus, a little bit more risky. And there, if we add our colposcopy, everybody who's got a high cell, who's HPV positive 16 and 18, 
or has high grade lesions when you look on the colposcopy, those are your highest risk of having a SIN3 um, and developing cancer. And then we take our biopsy from colposcopy and again the SIN2s and the SIN3s are the ones that are at highest risk. All right, so the next part was to talk about normal colposcopy. So we've, we've talked about it a little bit already, but when you put the speculum in, you want to see the cervix looking at you. You want to see the cervix looking straight. If it is pointing upwards or pointing downwards, you're not going to be able to see the transformation zone. You must adjust your speculum so that the cervix is pointing straight at you. So here we can see, oh, we've got, we have got an arrow, we've got an arrow, yeah. If you can just make out here, you can just see the, looks like the transformation zone right there. Okay, yeah, the uh, squamous columnar <coughs> junction. Okay, so, and if we remember from probably second year, third year, um, that when you are young, the squamocolonal junction sits on the outside of the cervix. It's under estrogen. So when your estrogen is depleted, when you go through menopause, the squamocolonal junction will go up into the cervical os. Okay. And that area between where it used to be and and the new squamous columnar junction is where the transformation zone is. Okay, so that is your, if you understand, that's where the, the cells are changing and turning over the most, and that is the most likely place where you're going to get cancer. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, the place where you are more likely to find eye disease is, is there. there. Okay, not there. Okay, so if we look at this patient, this is a very young patient, and that's not cancer. That's what we use to call the ectropion. So what we're seeing is that the squamous columnar junction is sitting right on the outside of the cervix. And these are actually glandular cells. Okay. Yeah? We'll see this um, nomenclature. They, you have to describe the transformation zone as type 1, 2, 3. So that is a type 1. So the whole of the transformation zone uh, is on the ectocervix, and you can see it. You can see the whole of the transformation zone. That's a type 1 transformation. Okay. So if we look here, you can see that there's something happening up there, but we can't really see the top of the transformation zone. And you can either then use an endocervical speculum, a Kogan speculum, or here they've just used, we used to have um, sort of cotton um, balls on the end of a swab, um, and we used to just try and open up the endocervix so that we could see the junction, which looks like it is just over there. So this is probably a type 2. So it's just, just up, and you can still see it just by opening up the cervix. So type 2 means that some of the transformation zone is located endocervically, but you can see all of it. Okay. So Prof. Boerter has talked a little bit about acetic acid. You can use a 3% or a 5%. 5%, the staining will happen quicker. 3%, um, you just have to wait a lot longer. And it precipitates the proteins in the epithelial cells. And normal squamous epithelium has low protein levels because the nuclei are very small. Um, and the acetic acid doesn't really stain it. But abnormal neoplastic ep epithelium has high protein content, has extra chromatin, has... Um, and the protein then gets coagulated and it goes that white, white color. So there we can see, um, again, before the acetic acid, and then after the acetic acid, we can see a nice aceto-white lesion over there. And then there's just another picture of 
an acetoyl-white lesion. The most important lesions that you're going to see, the most important high cell lesions, will be in that area of whiteness. So if we see a lesion outside of that, this isn't a cancer, this is where the transformation zone is. Because that doesn't stain either, yeah? Um, so do you see, with the feature to the, on the right hand side, um, so at the same time, the lesion is the same size as Yes, it's telling you where the transformation zone is. Yeah, yeah. So, in, in essence, you should try and get this whole lesion out, SD. But your most important area is your area, so that's why you now want to look with the colposcope and you want to say, okay, or well, this is all the same, but I mean, you want to say, okay, this is much whiter here. This is where my high cell lesion is, even though this whole thing, maybe this is low cell or squamous met, sometimes squamous metaplasia can also, but maybe you want to say, sure, this, this area is really staining dark, I must be sure to get that high cell area out with my um, thing. Sometimes the HPV Sometimes is just so much that it takes so over the, the, the whole cervix, the but whole you, you're trying to get rid of the high cell, that's what the let is for, to get rid of the high cell. But, yeah. And, but you want the, tra you're quite right, so the, your chance of cancer is highest at your um, transformation zone, at, your, at the junction over here. So if I saw a lesion over here, then I want to be absolutely sure that I get that lesion out and that I want to get up to the top of the transformation zone with my legs. Yeah, because maybe it's just me, but I feel that it's not safe to remove that large part thing if I went to the legs. Maybe I can... No, you have to do it. I'm not treating you. You can, you must. Remember, it's easy to remove that out of it. You need to come in. So you do your... And that is why you have to choose the appropriate size. Um, and then you can to, to remove that on the, on the periphery of the endocervix. You don't have to cut deep. You can, you don't know, there's no law that says you have to take one sweep at right. Okay. Because sometimes you don't have a large enough loop. Enough but then, so, but then if that, so if some of that remains on the periphery, you can just, you don't have to cut deep there. Uh, you move that. With the second, with the second sword. Yeah, or you do the top and the bottom. And, the top and, the bottom. and then a little extra one in the middle just for safety's sake. <laughs> um, okay. Um, okay. So, okay. so uh, if we look uh, at Lugol's iodine, as we've said, squamous epithelium has glycogen. It's taken up, it goes brown. Columnar epithelium, in other words, the epithelium where the glandular cells are, does not stain at all. So, oh, I'll show you now. And pre precancerous lesions have little glycogen, and they turn into that sort of yellowy, mustardy color. So there we can see there. So this isn't a lesion here. That's the transformation. Your lesions are these two. So you want to make sure so you're going to get those sure out, with, those your, out with, your, with your with your um, legs. Um, legs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, that's what I mean. The, the glandular cells the are glandular not staining cells here. Are not staining that's, here. The that's the top end of your um, squamous um, columnar junction. That's where your endos your endocervical your, your yeah. In the cervical, your glandular cells stop. Okay, so then just again, um, looking at the transformation zone, there's saline, and then we put some acetic acid on, and then we put some Lugol's iodine on. So it's to know where exactly the transformation zone ends. Look at the gland openings. Uh, and the most peripheral gland openings is where the original squamoglomerate junction was. That's the outer rim of it. And obviously where the endocervix uh, 
grows over eight and that's the new the newly formed form of